is James Conn, the guy on the bike. And we are down here at the new Whitney. And we're going to try to run in here for the last half an hour of the press preview. And uh, get a picture of Frank Stella. Boy, I didn't want to wait for the elevator, so I went up to the fifth floor. Thank you. Okay. Well, I just uh, pedaled in from Brooklyn, and when I left Brooklyn, it was spritzing a little bit, but uh, by the time I got to Manhattan, it was really raining. And as I understand it, this exhibition takes up the whole fifth floor. And a couple of examples of Frank's major pieces. This is titled Pratt Fall 1974. And uh, gosh, I'd say that's probably at least uh, maybe a 10 foot square. Wow. This is a big painting. And uh, yeah, it's got a lot of uh, interesting, tricky things. It's collage on there. I think this might be even laser cut stuff. Das Erdbeben in Chile. Well, you know, there is a lot of uh, computer assisted drafting on this, uh, digital prints, other types of. Uh, Cutting, stenciling, flocking. I think the thing that's kind of interesting about this is this is pretty flat. It doesn't have major uh, sections of these planes sticking out into actual space. Okay, well, I'm late and they're going to shut this down in about a half an hour. But we're just going to kind of chronologically run through the rooms and take a look. These are some of uh, Frank's early pieces and uh, I like the question they've got on the wall. There are two problems in painting. One is to find out what painting is, the other is to find out how to make a painting. And uh, well, I think Frank Stella is or could be called the golden boy of American abstraction. Uh, this is a guy who was discovered when he was 23 years old. It's titled Delta 1958. And uh, Dorothy Miller found him and uh, put him into a very important show titled 16 Americans at the Museum of Modern Art. And that was the same show that uh, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg were in. But I think Frank was only 23 at the time. Anyway, his uh, Stripe paintings were kind of the, uh, the pieces that got him the main attention and at the time a piece like this was considered a sacrilege. This is right at, I guess, probably the end of the uh, 10th Street School and the Abstract Expressionists. But um, I think I've read where Frank said that he was actually influenced by the stripes of Jasper Johns and his flags. And uh, so this is kind of his, his response to that, sort of boil them down and uh, reduce them to their essence. You know, a lot of people that uh, <laughs> wish that Frank was still doing nothing but the black stripe pieces. Oh, hey, there's Ben Davis, writes for Artnet. Well, I think this is the next phase of Frank's work. And uh, so now we started to uh, kind of get into the diagonals. Oh, this is great. We've got some of his sketches. Well, here are some of his early studies. This must be from the late 50s.
Well, he's a good draftsman, and uh, yeah, look at that lettering. Oh, this is great. This is like a little codex. Well, I think shortly after his debut at uh, 16 Americans, Frank was picked up by Leo Castelli. And so he was in the same gallery with Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns. Well, these are nice. I believe this is aluminum paint. And the little, the little slots are interesting. You know, it is despite his uh, attempts at uh, kind of being precise and uh, mechanical, there is a real nice uh, sense of the hand and the touch. This is also the phase when he, uh, I guess, was heralded as one of the founders of minimalism. You know, these uh, shaped and notched pieces, I think, uh, were very influential by, for people like Don Judd when he was writing his, his manifesto of minimalism, talking about how there was a lot of work nowadays that uh, was somewhere between painting and sculpture. And uh, he talked about the fact that uh, because these pieces were so thick and because the, uh, the stretchers were notched, that uh, this kind of uh, provided a certain amount of uh, sculptural qualities. Oh, actually I saw this painting at the Modern. Maybe it was the Metropolitan when Frank had a show on the roof at the Met. And this is one of the paintings we talked about, and I commented that uh, the fluorescent paint it held up extremely well, and uh, you know, like a painter, he kind of rubs it with his thumb and goes, "Yeah, that was good stuff." It's titled Conway, 1966, and. Uh, I've actually talked to Frank a couple times, and uh, I think one of the reasons that I admire him is that, uh, you know, he's not like some of these uh, art stars that sort of uh, exist as some eminent Gris, somebody out in the boondocks that only appears here and there. He's really engaged. I think towards the end of the 60s, Frank started doing work like this, the protractors. And, uh, well, he really started punching up his colors, you know. A lot of this is almost like psychedelic colors. And, uh, some of these are very ambitious. I don't know what the size of this piece is, but I would say that it's at least, uh, maybe 20 feet long. It's titled Haran 1967. You know, he's got a very nice, kind of a dry, soaked-in paint surface. But there is a quality, you know, wonderful color quality that he gets with that dry surface. It's titled Montonville, 1966, and Effingham. So here again, he's kind of uh, distilling his geometric forms rather than presenting that or that in a rectangle. He's just kind of 
cut away the the backgrounds and made the the form the shape of the the canvas and here again you know it's not just uh, bold bright uh, primary colors and fluorescence but he's got some nice uh, tertiaries here that kind of yellow ochre and olive green uh, okay I think these pieces are called the uh, tropical bird series and uh, this is the stuff that I saw when I first came to New York so we're talking late 70s early 80s and uh, well it was kind of interesting to watch the uh, the trajectory of Frank's aesthetic because he started out as what I said a kind of a proto minimalist the black and white stripe paintings and then uh, <laughs> after about 10 years suddenly 10 or 12 years he's doing this stuff which kind of uh, related to neo-expressionism or as some people have called it maximalism and uh, I think one of the other things that's always been interesting for me about Frank is that uh, he loves uh, new materials, new techniques, new machines to do things um, as we progress through the show we'll probably get up to some of the more recent pieces where I think that he goes to uh, maybe high-tech yacht builders and uses composites and uh, all kinds of uh, hardware this piece is titled oh, not too bad not too bad okay not too bad this is titled the whiteness of the whale okay so he did a whole series on Moby Dick yeah, yeah. back in the mid 80s which was about the time that uh, he was involved with Carl Andre and Carl Andre was a longtime friend of his and uh, Carl was arrested for the murder of uh, Anna Mendieta and uh, Frank bailed him out oh well the other thing is that Frank has never been uh, restrained he's never been modest about his uh, his goals and his uh, ambition it's a huge piece it's titled Michael's counter guard you know a lot of this actually and he's kind of uh, cagey about the whole idea but uh, a lot of this is actually sculpture and uh, I remember seeing a show of his, this has got to be four or five years ago, and uh, <laughs> he called it high reliefs. Maybe we'll see some of them later on, but uh, they were basically sculpture that maybe touched the wall. It's titled Chaudhuro, and uh, yeah, again, I like these kind of more subtle colors. That red kind of makes me think of uh, Campbell's tomato soup with a little milk in there. So, this phase when he uh, really went uh, maximal, you know, a lot of people were criticizing him because he started to use the uh, expressionistic brush strokes and the textures and uh, even the glitter so uh, Frank doesn't just like move slowly <laughs> in tiny little steps he kind of jumps in whole hog on these things this is titled Inaccessible Island 1976 and uh, God, he's got flocking, enamel, that could be oil stick, and uh, 
This is all on honeycomb aluminum panels. And uh, I don't know where he has these fabricated, but they do a great job. I caught up with Frank uh, when he was having a show of uh, sculptures on the roof at the Met, and uh, I kind of uh, impertinently went over and uh, buttonholed him for a second and uh, asked him his, his ideas or his thoughts about postmodernism. And, uh, well, Frank, in a lot of ways, is a very, very thoughtful guy. He sort of said, uh, you know, postmodernism doesn't give me anything. And uh, that's kind of like his statement of what you see is what you see. What I took from that was that uh, modernism had goals. Modernism knew what it was after, knew what it needed to change, knew what it needed to attack. And uh, from Fra Frank's viewpoint, uh, postmodernism just maybe asked a question or tried to create doubts about uh, the system. Oh, this is sweet. I remember seeing these exhibited at Leo Castelli maybe in the late 70s, early 80s. See the maquettes for the uh, tropical birds. And as I understand it, he had these fabricated in India. So he'd do the designs and uh, people out in some little village or factory would make these out of uh, Coca-Cola cans, different kinds of uh, metal signs and things. Actually, I like those. This is an interesting presentation. They've actually got this uh, on a recess in the wall. And geez, it's on a stretcher that must be about uh, nine inches thick. This is titled Kamionka Stromilowa. <laughs> I think this could be the, uh, the epitome of his uh, tropical bird series, his maximalism series. So, uh, and yeah, this piece has probably got to stick out about uh, 18, 20 inches. And you could just go down the list of all the materials he's using. And then, uh, God, he's also... Uh, what, using a grinder or a router or something to even cut through the uh, the paint surfaces back into the metal. Okay, wow. I think anybody, oh gee, there's James Pinero. <laughs> anybody that could, uh, Put this painting in their uh, in their living room would be doing all right. See, I stayed at a hotel in Las Vegas a couple of years ago. It's the Vidora, and they had one of these behind the uh, the registration desk. This is a nice piece. I like the. Uh, the yellow Z. Well, we're just going to keep moving because this is going to wrap up in about 15 minutes. Now, this may be a huge uh, print. I think it is. Woodcut. The aqua tint. And, uh, yeah, like I said, Frank is not one that's going to uh, pull back because his, uh, his ideas are too modest. This is titled The Fountain Woodcut Etching Aqua Tint Relief Dry Point Collage and Airbrush. And this is an artist proof, and I don't know, but I'd say that piece is at least 20 feet long. Okay, that's nice. So 
He's got kind of like a homoseta board and felt. And I think that he was just using the natural color as kind of a particle board. You know, Frank is also kind of a polemicist and uh, I know he wrote, wrote at least one book that got a lot of press, I guess, in the end of the end of the 80s, early 90s, about the whole idea of modernism and what modernism meant. This is kind of nice. I like the way that he uh, he varies the angles of his planes. Oh, and so this is uh, this is not uh, honeycomb aluminum, but it's uh, corrugated cardboard. This is sexy. <laughs> Lots of glitter. Oh, this is beautiful. This is all wood. It's titled Beckhofen. You know, Frank has gotten a lot of uh, questions about his titles and uh, I know that his initial series of black and white stripes, a lot of it was in German and he was uh, actually using slogans that had been used by the Nazis. And uh, I think some of these other pieces are named after various places in Poland. You know, there are a lot of artists that could have made an entire career out of uh, an idea like this. And, uh, well, it says a lot about Frank's originality and his uh, kind of constant drive and curiosity and uh, experimentation that he just keeps <laughs> keeps going and going and coming up with new uh, new solutions. Well, I uh, just spoke with James Panero and he was saying that uh, the layout of the show is not really chronological, and this is a good example. Uh, I guess that uh, Frank kind of came in and uh, decided that he didn't want to have everything just laid out uh, chronologically, that he would kind of mix things around. And, uh, well, this gets to what I was talking about. This is what a lot of the, uh, the new work looks like. This is titled... Rejang 2009 fiberglass and stainless steel tubing and uh, so he's had these tubes bent very beautiful arcs and he's even got the little kind of a squiggle and then he's had this uh, orange fiberglass molded so that it almost looks like uh, drapery blowing in the wind and this section, he hasn't really uh, taken the time to uh, kind of change the material surface so you get the, the weave and the, the color of the resin and the, the fiber. This is another one of the recent pieces. Well, like I said, Fred, uh, Frank is kind of cagey and uh, a lot of these works he considers paintings and I think in in that way he just wants to kind of tweak people with the idea of uh, what a painting is versus what a sculpture is. Okay, these are some of the uh, most recent pieces. Uh, I love this part of the Whitney. This is great. I've got the wonderful uh, view over the Hudson. Now. I would be hard pressed to call this a painting, but <laughs> now this is a, definitely a sculpture. And uh, well, I think that Frank probably hangs around at the uh, the sculpture fabrication shops and uh, probably spends a lot of time scavenging around in their uh, recycle bins.
You know, this is almost exactly the opposite of uh, where he started out, where everything was very controlled, very linear, clean, and this is all over the place. Rugged, ragged, crumbly, bumpy. Also, this is interesting, the way they've got this uh, attached on the wall, it's almost like it's its not really bolted to the wall, it's just uh, hanging in there with hooks. This is uh, an interesting piece. So uh, I guess this is some kind of uh, cast composite. And uh, oh, he's out of cut plexiglass. I think Frank does a great job of kind of mixing uh, maybe high Baroque with. Uh, Space Age Kitsch. Oh. Well, this is where Frank gets to play. I think that he probably uh, spends a lot of time thinking about these things, making these. This piece right here is an example of the kind of work that was shown at uh, a show that he called High Reliefs and, uh, well, <laughs> okay, so he's got three legs that touch the wall, but you could pretty much drive a truck behind this thing and uh, you can go back, I think I've covered at least three of his shows. And, uh, well, I was saying that uh, one of the things about this particular series is that uh, Frank might have been hanging out with uh, some of the car culture people because uh, this has got uh, frosted metal flake and uh, highly lacquered surfaces. Look like something you'd see on a uh, custom-built 1932 Roadster. Well, hmm, I guess you have to go too far before you know <laughs> how far too far is. This one was a little, maybe a little, a little crumbly, a little, <laughs> a little too much. You know, uh, I think also, Frank probably spends a lot of time looking at uh, blueprints of uh, aircraft or, like I was saying, yachts. And, uh, well, he's a, he really is a classic modernist and he's someone that believes that form follows function. And uh, if he can find something like a set of uh, strut designs or some kind of... Uh, a little crack there. <laughs> Some kind of uh, architectural design element that looks good. He's going to use it. All right, smile, ladies. Well, it looks like they're letting in the uh, the general crowds now. So this is James Calm. Reporting on Frank Stella, a retrospective here at the Whitney. And as always, let me hear you say it, folks. 
Thank you, Kate. Thank you.